Good evening, everyone. I am Wendy Sigger, Director of Education of Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, Board of Directors, staff and volunteers, I am honored to welcome each of you to today's program. As an institution grounded in the history and lessons of the Holocaust that works to share universal lessons of humanity and generate awareness and action against injustices worldwide, it is a pleasure to share this very special book and author event, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope by Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun, moderated by Museum Vice President of our Board of Directors at Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, Rick Solomon. Husband and wife duo, Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun were, first, were, were the first married couple to win a Pulitzer Prize in journalism and have written a series of best-selling books together as well as appeared in television documentaries of their books. Their number one bestseller, Half the Sky, called Electrifying by the Washington Post draws a compelling picture of trials and triumphs of women struggling worldwide for opportunity and equality. They follow that with A Path Appears, again, both a best selling book and PBS documentary, exploring how people can make a difference at home and abroad. In their new book, Height Ropes Americans Reaching for Hope, which came out this year in 2020, they issue a plea to address the crisis in working class America, while also focusing on solutions to mend a half century of government failure. A two-time Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the New York Times, Kristoff is often called a reporter's reporter for his activism and was the subject of the 2009 Sundance Film Doc Festival documentary Reporter. He has lived on four continents, reported on six, and traveled to 140 countries, all 50 states, every Chinese province, and every main Japanese island in order to offer a compassionate glimpse into global health, poverty, and gender in the developing world. As part of Half the Sky, the Half the Sky documentary series, Christoph traveled around the world along with celebrity activists, Ameri a celebrity activists, America Ferrara, Diane Lane, Eva Mendez, Meg Ryan, Gabrielle Union, and Olivia Wilde to meet inspiring individuals confronting the global oppression of women. The first Asian American to win a Pulitzer Prize, Wu Dun is a business executive entrepreneur, and best-selling author. She has special expertise in China, entrepreneurship, impact investing, and helping companies do both well and good. She is co-founder of Full Sky Partners, which advises healthcare and technology companies that also have social impact. And she is a principal at Grayson's Partners USA, a firm focusing on young healthcare and diagnostics companies. Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun love storytelling, love telling stories that, that surprise and persuade. Before we begin our conversation, we wanted to let you know that there will be a Q&A question and answer period after their conversation. Please submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. There are over 700 people registered for tonight's program and people are here from around the nation. We will do our best to get as, to as many questions as we can. And now I welcome our moderator, our very own Rick Solomon. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for that fine introduction. I would like to start Nick and Cheryl by commending your extensive research in tightrope. As you inform me, your wonderful book, which I highly recommend to everyone reading, will air also as a PBS documentary scheduled for broadcast nationally on October 26. Please check your local listings. We're going to now play a two-minute trailer 
to set the scene for our discussion from the documentary. Jeff, if you could do that. One of my most powerful memories from childhood is the number six school bus. But this memory is also tinged with sadness. Because today, about a quarter of the kids who rode that bus with me are no longer alive. Honestly, it just sucks, man. I had everything I wanted in my early 20s. I have nothing now. We can get prostitutes, we can get drugs. This is no place for a child to be, even an adult. I mean, I heard he sort of blew himself up yeah. making math, yeah. Yeah. Left a big hole in the horror, left in the heart, too. I'm Nicholas Kristoff. My wife, Cheryl, and I have worked together for decades, covering some of the greatest injustices of our time. Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wooden. Their coverage won them a Pulitzer Prize. Which but we've become increasingly shocked by what's been taking place here in America. Now, Nick and I are traveling across the country into the heart of communities battling despair. America is unique when it comes to inequality. We are the richest country on the planet with the worst poverty. That's who we are. My wife said, please call me. That's all she wrote. That text message, I knew my brother was dead. You're taught that anyone who used these drugs are evil people. You're not given any indication that these are people who are dealing with health issues. We're in the worst affordable housing crisis in years, maybe decades. So four families living in a single wide. Yes. We want to understand how so many people fell through the cracks and what can be done to change things. I'm not rich. I have two roommates. I don't own my house. I barely own a running car. But there needs to be people that are willing to say, hey, let me help you. I think it takes a village for someone to succeed. If it wasn't for the support, I don't think I would have just done it. Whether or not there will be opportunity for everyone, that's the question that we're facing right now as a nation. So it's time for a new version of the American dream, one that includes everybody. Welcome, Nick and Cheryl, uh, to our program. We're delighted to have you. I believe you're Zooming right now from Oregon. Is that right? That's right, we are. We're, we're on the family farm. We, we just wish we could be there physically at the museum. As do we, a, a future time for sure. So let's get into it a little. Disappointing jobs, lack of adequate health care, drug dependency, alcoholism, depression, suicide, lack of education, spiraling out of control, a balancing act that you so aptly name a tightrope walk for many working class families in both rural and urban America. Tell us a little, Nick, if you would, about Bus Line 6 in Yamhill, Oregon, where, as you point out in the documentary, fully a quarter of your classmates that were on the bus with you are no longer alive. Yeah, so Yamhill uh, here is a little farm town, population 1,000 on a good day. It was an area that had done very well for most of the 20th century. The biggest employers are logging, farming, and light manufacturing. Um, like my neighbors uh, right down the hill from us here, the people who got on the bus right after me each morning uh, were the, the nap kids, five nap kids. Uh, Farland was my grade, um, his younger brother, Zelan, uh, brother Nathan, uh, baby brother Keelan, and sister Regina. And um, their dad, by virtue of a good union job laying pipe, had uh, been able to, they'd been able to buy their own house. When Farland turned 16, uh, his family got him a Ford Mustang and we were all incredibly jealous of Farland. But those kinds of jobs, those kind of good union jobs disappeared in Yamhill, as they did in Baltimore, in Maine, and Kentucky, all over the country. And uh, Farland, after he lost his job, he went into a downward spiral. He self-medicated. 
he died of liver failure uh, from using drugs and alcohol. His brother Zeeland uh, died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. His brother Nathan blew himself up cooking meth. His sister Rogina uh, died of hepatitis from injecting drugs. And Keelan, uh, the youngest, was uh, alive at the time the book came out. But in March, um, as COVID was spreading, he, um, he self-medicated, he lost his job and he died of a heroin overdose. And so all five kids who a generation earlier had exemplified this sense of upper mobility and, and looking forward to the future, all gone now, even though their mother is still alive. And that's a microcosm of what has happened in so many communities around the country. You know, with Keelan, if I recall from the book, you wrote that he spared himself by going to prison, but now as you describe and update us, uh, he's died since. So before we get to you, Cheryl, on some aspects of this, I have to ask the question, Nick, tell us how you were different. You grew up in the same milieu. You lived on a sheep and cherry farm. How yet? You went to Harvard, if I recall, and you also had, were a Rhodes Scholar and a multiple Pulitzer Prize winner. So what gives? You're, uh, you froze for just a moment, but I, I think I got that. I think it's maybe at our end. Um, the, so I, um, I was geographically aligned with my classmates, but not socially. So my parents uh, were professors who commuted to Portland. So the Knapp kids, I don't think they had a single book in their house. My house is surrounded by books. Um, my parents hugged me. Mr. Knapp was firing guns at Mrs. Knapp and brutally beating her up. Those kids were deeply traumatized. Um, Mr. Knapp was an alcoholic. Um, and so I think that, you know, I won the lottery of birth with my parents and it was assumed that I would graduate from high school, that I would go on to college. And I do think that if I had been in that Knapp household, then my trajectory would have been entirely different. And if Farland had been in this household, it would have been completely different. And Farland might now be talking here about coordinate Christoph. Uh, it's so much of our outcomes in America today depend on where we begin. Indeed. And, you know, would you also say that you had meals and discussed things together as well as the importance of education? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, there is, there was so little physical distance separating me from my neighbors and just this enormous gulf of, of, of a sense of community, of love, of intellectual stimulation. And we measure child poverty typically with metrics of income and wealth. I think in many ways one can make the argument that the more useful metrics of child poverty are how often a child is hugged or how often that child is read to. And um, I <laughs> grew up by that standard in enormous wealth and Farland in enormous poverty. Indeed, you also have a great line if I recall in the book where your parents cherished poetry over carburetors. I think Goethe, <laughs> the German poet. So well, well said. Cheryl, talk to us a little about the plight of the former neighbors of Nick and the folks in Yamhill in terms of how they, the situation that Nick has well described has been exacerbated by the pandemic and the recent fires, if I may ask. Right. So first of all, I think it's really important to understand that when we were correspondents abroad, we did travel uh, around the region and saw a variety of different types of backgrounds. Uh, we you know, interviewed people who were very, very wealthy, but also we interviewed people who were ex in extreme poverty throughout China, throughout Southeast Asia, throughout Asia. And we had been coming back um, once a year to, to Yamhill, you know, partly on our vacation. And we had you know, been meeting with Nick's friends and other people who were from his high school uh, some of the workers who, some of his former classmates were working on the farm, working on the family farm, but we had never really delved into their backgrounds. And so it was really important to see that uh, when we started asking them questions, that's when we started seeing how precarious their lives were. 
just really bordering on the edge of barely able to have enough to eat and just falling off a cliff. Uh, so that's partly why we named it Tightrope, the book, because it really, these people are walking on a tightrope. So if you can imagine these people walking on a tightrope before the pandemic, you can just imagine now what they are like. Uh, and that's why um, Keelan, what happened to him was so important because Keelan actually was planning to be in a conference with us in the spring. Uh, he was so proud of the book and he was proud to tell his story. He said, you know, this is my family. I wanna tell my family's story in person. So we were all planning it, you know, something to look forward to, but the pandemic hit. And of course, you know, he lost a job and that not only, you know, spiraled him, spiraled him into a psychological depression, but also uh, there was no income. Uh, you know, he, how embarrassing it was for him to rely on his mother's social security. Uh, and um, so he was um, just, you know, doing a lot more drugs and we're not sure if it was fentanyl, but uh, that is uh, possible that that's what pushed him over the edge. And that's really important now because a lot of people during the pandemic, they're isolated. Uh, you know, if they've lost their jobs, you know, as 11 million people don't have their jobs anymore, who did have jobs before the pandemic, you know, if they can't find a job right away, uh, then, you know, and there, there are no more stimulus uh, payments, uh, they don't see, you know, a light uh, at the end of the tunnel. And so then it's very easy to get fentanyl now, which is so far cheaper than any kind of opioid drug we've seen on the marketplace. And, you know, it, it, you can see, you can imagine what's happening. Even before the pandemic, uh, the deaths of despair, which um, are uh, it, it, it sort of deaths that are named by um, Angus Deaton and Anne Case, two economists at Princeton, uh, even before the pandemic, the deaths of despair were really, you know, almost at their record high for the three, last three out of four years. Uh, you know, we, our life expectancy for all Americans had gone backwards, which is not what's happened at any of the other Western countries. But of course, with COVID, uh, that has changed the entire picture. But it also means that probably deaths of despair have skyrocketed. And unless we recognize that, I don't think there's gonna be a turnaround. And we are so focused on COVID right now. We're so focused on the actual disease, but the disease uh, may actually spread. Uh, and we'll have a pandemic among people uh, in the US who may not ever catch COVID. It's a different pandemic. It's a pandemic of isolation, of you know, uh, depression, of suicide, of despair. Indeed, and layer on to that because we talked the other day about you know the searing fires in the area and otherwise, and what toll that is taking, if I may. Right, the um, the fires are also a, a very sad um, uh, you know uh, situation. Um, actually, you know the fire came. There was a big fire in our region that came within five miles of our farm where we are right now. Uh, so um, it has affected so many people economically because all of their crops actually were, um, uh, were really negatively affected if you hadn't uh, picked, if you haven't harvested before then. Uh, and you know, that's an indication that we do as policymakers need to take more specific and targeted action uh, on, on things that will actually protect, uh, you know, protect, uh, you know, protect um, our, you know, our lands. I mean, you know, I know there's a big debate. You know, we heard it on the debate between President Trump and Joe Biden on climate change. Uh, you have to do all these things. You, it's not just uh, something you have to address the climate change. It's not just climate change. But it also isn't just forest management. It's all of those things. We have to actually manage the forests better, but we also need funding. If you cut funding uh, to, uh, that, that you're using to manage the federal forests, how on earth do you think that they're going to be managed better? Uh, and so, you know, at the same time, you also need to, uh, uh, you know, come up with a much more um, practical and uh, realistic climate change policy and not just, you know, on principle, pull out of the Paris Accord and say, you know, I don't believe that's real. I mean, it's just not a practical, uh, you know, approach. Indeed. Um, 
let's widen the aperture a little. Uh, Cheryl and Nick, your research took you elsewhere in the United States, other rural and urban communities. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, um, I mean, one of the striking things face in that, um, you know, back in the 1990s when communities like Yamhill, and I think in a lot of white America, when people looked at the struggles in, in, among, in African American communities, there was a kind of a glib scornfulness and a lot of talk about uh, bad choices and uh, deadbeat dads and uh, junkies and, and this kind of thing. And meanwhile, the uh, great Harvard uh, sociologist William Julius Wilson said, no, it's about jobs. It's about jobs, losing jobs in communities. And he was exactly right, because when jobs left Yam Hill and when they left, uh, you know, Kentucky and when they left Maine and West Virginia, then you saw very, very similar pathologies. And I don't think that my own progressive community adequately appreciated the importance of a job, not only as an income stream, Did you freeze? Of losing those jobs. Um, and so one sees, you know, these very similar patterns uh, across the country. Um, and yet it hasn't gotten, from our point of view, enough attention. It was one reason we wrote Tightrope. I spent a lot of time reporting in Afghanistan and Iraq. And those were important stories that had to be addressed. But every two weeks in America, we lose more Americans from drugs, alcohol, and suicide than we lost in 19 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And those deaths here at home on the home front, that pain on the home front, I don't think has been adequately acknowledged or addressed. But I also think that it's important to see in terms of uh, the pandemic, because we've had 200,000 people die. And it's not just in the short term, we've got to better manage the pandemic. We absolutely have to. But in the long run, we also need to have better health care. We need to have more people who are much healthier so that they aren't as susceptible to dying from this kind of um, the disease. Uh, you know, if you have chronic diseases like diabetes or if you have, you know, uh, you know lung diseases, you're obviously much more susceptible to dying from, from COVID. If you're in better health, you have a fighting chance to survive it. But partly because our health care uh, is, is really not you know, ideal to say the least, um, a lot of people don't have access to health care. And so over the years, their, their problem, chronic diseases build up. And you know, this is a, a real issue. And uh, you know, I, I think that um, it isn't surprising that uh, the US has had uh, more, more deaths per, per capita than, than other Western countries. Sure. Two books that you, you mentioned in your own book, um, uh, and pr uh, perhaps you want to comment on this one, Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. For those on the call, you know, he comes from Appalachia. I'm simplifying this. It, you know, it goes into the military, ends up at Yale Law School, among other venues. Educated, a book by Tara Westover, uh, who comes from Idaho, who was influenced by the Mormon Church and also going to university, ending up at Cambridge University. So how did that type of research factor into your own work and thinking, and did you interact with them, if I may? Um, Tara is a friend, and Tara Westover, and we you know, enormously admire uh, uh, her, and, and we enjoyed Hillbilly Elegy. Um, I think, frankly, from my point of view, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, emphasizes a little bit too much the personal responsibility narrative that, that people get in trouble because of bad choices. And I think that's true, but I think that those bad choices follow from a trajectory that is, you know, that, that, that starts early. And I, you know, my neighbors made plenty of bad choices, um, but we as a society, you as taxpayers paid an awful lot of money to incarcerate them rather than to educate them, rather than to provide them with job training, 
rather than to provide them with drug treatment, all of which I think would have been more effective. And in America, when you can look at a zip code and make a good guess about what will happen to that child uh, decades down the road, then that's not because that infant is making bad choices. It's because we as a society are making bad choices about the support that that child gets. And you know, it, it does strike me that both, um, both Tara and JD, in some respects, were rescued by institutions. Um, and for JD, that was the, the military. For Tara, uh, that was uh, Brigham Young and the and the Mormon uh, Church, and there are so many <laughs> talented kids out there who are literally dying, or at least certainly not living up to their potential because they aren't getting that kind of support. One of there's an adage that Cheryl and I, you know, that means a lot to us that uh, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Talent is universal, but opportunity is not, and I think the challenge for our country and for policymakers is to try to do what we can to nurture uh, that talent by providing that opportunity. But I think it's really important for us not to always think of, oh, that means big government. Um, just mind you, we've lived in China. We have seen the way big government operates. And you know, it's not something that I am totally fond of either. I, 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 you know, it, it, it's, it has its challenges. Um, but you need targeted assistance. So for instance, one way to illustrate that is what happened after the financial crisis when auto workers were laid off both in Detroit and also in Canada, in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, often by the same company. So you actually got to compare how the different systems you know, uh, you know, and, uh, treated or, or handled this issue. So in the US, um, you know, a lot of auto workers were laid off, they got you know, robust uh, unemployment insurance because of the special circumstances, the U.S. you know bumped up the uh, unemployment insurance, but they lost their health care because that came with the job. Over in Canada, the same company laying off uh, people in Canada, well, they lost their job. They didn't lose their health care because they have national health care in Canada, uh, but also the government, you know, kicked in and said, okay, um, we know how uh, impactful this can be if a whole bunch of people in the town lose, lose their jobs. What other areas, industries, are, is there a need for people you know, for labor? And they discovered that healthcare um, had a huge uh, need. And so they helped facilitate training programs so that some of these auto workers could train uh, to retrain uh, to get jobs in the healthcare industry. So um, you know, just after a few years, you've got these Canadians who they relied on the government for a little bit, but they're now back on their feet because they've got jobs. Uh, you know, they, they don't have problems with healthcare. Back in the US, we all know what happened to Detroit. Um, it's taken years and years and years to recover. It's now much more vibrant, but those families, they also lost their healthcare and finding a job in a town where the biggest employer just laid off a whole bunch of people, that is extremely hard. And there was very little uh, job retraining assistance. So, I, I think that's much more important for us to understand that we're looking for when we're trying to propose, uh, you know, programs, um, you know, whether it's government or larger institutions that are targeted um, uh, for certain outcomes, not just a big government that's there just to invade your life and, and be there forever. Important point. You both are very tele, you know, telepathic because. Um, Cheryl, you raised the issue of training programs, and I'm going to get into that. But the next line I was going to ask about, Nick, was the quote you had. I have it on my script here. Talent is usual. Opportunity is not. And so, you know, it's about the lottery of birth, as you say. But let's touch on for a minute before we go to prescriptions. U.S. standing in the world. You point out that of the 161 countries in the world, most of which you both visited, on the Social Progress Index, the U.S. ranks 40 in child mortality, 61 in high school enrollment, among other stats. Either of you, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, so we tend to think of the U.S. as number one. You know, we're number one, and and of course we are the number one in number of aircraft carriers, in military capacity, in cultural impact, in many ways, in technology. Uh, in medical technology, we're roughly 
uh, number one at our best. And yet we're uh, something like number 95 in access to health care. And of course, 3 million fewer Americans have health insurance today than did in February before the pandemic, because just when people most needed that coverage, then they lost their jobs and as a result, their health insurance as well. American kids are 55% more likely to die by age 19 than kids in other OECD countries and other advanced countries. Uh, women are two or three times as likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth in the US than in uh, Europe. And education was something, mass education was what we in the US invented. Europe had Eden, they had Oxford. We did the mass high school. We did the, the mass tertiary education. And yet um, since the 1970s, so many other countries have eclipsed us. And again, we seem myopic about that. There was a lot of good talk in the democratic primaries about improving college access, which is crucial, but there was very little conversation about the fact that one in seven American kids still doesn't graduate from high school. And those kids are cut. Well, so it's really important because I think people say, oh, well, so who cares about some index? Well, you know, it is important because if you look at our global standing and our competitiveness in the world, we've got China looming with 1.4 billion people. We've got India with soon to have 1.4 billion people. You know, if we're looking at just the elite They're going to be far more competitive uh, than we in the U.S. So what does that mean? That means that here in the U.S., um, we want to lift up every American so that each American can be operating at its, his or her fullest capacity possible so that we can, as a country, uh, become, you know, number one again. You know, let's put together Team USA. And let's actually compete and get back to uh, number one, you know, and have everybody get with the team, regardless of whether you're red or you're blue, you know, or, or you know, you know, whatever, whatever flavor you are in politics. It's really important that if we want to maintain the standard of living that we have, the entire country has to move up. And so that means trying to help your fellow American so that we can once again uh, get to number one on so many of these different fronts. Before we get into prescriptions, one other quote in your book to ask you to comment on quickly. Uh, and the quote is, the American economy has dazzled. The world and its stock market has created great riches, but the median American household is actually poorer in net worth today than it was in 2000. So my question to you is, is the American dream with the lot of each successive generation doing better than the last dying or dead in your view? Um, so I think that it's very much alive if people have a certain amount of educational capital, for example, if they get in the, you know, the right, um, the right household with the right parents, et cetera. But I think that for an awful lot, you know, a third of Americans or something, they where what people are struggling economically, but also struggling educationally then I think there is less of that mobility around. And that for a country that prides itself on not having a class system, we in many ways do have an aristocracy, but it's not about gentry, it's not about title, it's really in a way about transmitting educational opportunities, um, which then correlate to income and, and standing. And that I think um, has become, the US in that sense has become more ossified. And I see that right here in the Amhill. I saw that with the kids on my bus. I see that with friends who are still struggling. So let's touch on a little some of the prescriptions since our time is short. Early childhood education, drug treatment, focus on jobs retain, retraining that you mentioned, Cheryl. Touch on that a little more or expand if you would. Uh, well, first of all, we think one of the most important uh, you know, interventions would be early childhood education. Uh, because uh, you get more for your bang for your buck. Uh, you know, between the ages of zero and five, your brain is um, growing the fastest it will ever grow in a lifetime. Uh, and the brain architecture is developing. 
So when kids are born into families where there's abuse, uh, you know, when there's fighting, when there's actual, you know, gunshots uh, being fired, uh, that's a problem for the baby. We always think of young kids as very resilient. Well, you know something? They are to an extent, but they're far less resilient than we think. And in fact, what's happening when there is child abuse and when there is, you know, just this trauma uh, in a household, it's, it forces cortisol uh, through the brain of the, of the young child, just in the way that we have stress and cortisol starts, you know, coursing through our brain. The same thing happens with little kids. The difference is that when the brain is actually developing, that cortisol impairs the development of the brain architecture. So you have this window where you really can help that kid get onto a better traje life trajectory. So we think that it's very important to focus on early childhood education, um, you know, even starting um, earlier than that with the nurse family partnership home visitations, where you actually can basically give parental training. Uh, it's basically lessons in parenting to new mothers, often who are very young and just aren't prepared for, for raising kids. That's really critical. And then there are, all, uh, there are a few other policy prescriptions like baby bonds that actually will help families um, to focus on planning for the future, to save for education. Uh, and you know, that's something that they should have as a goal, that their kid goes to, uh, goes to school, goes to college even, plant that um, in, in their minds. And again, as you mentioned, yes, uh, vocational training. Uh, job retraining is really important. You know, we often are very dismissive of vocational training and job retraining. We think, oh yeah, well, we've tried that so many times. We've put so much money out for job retraining. They never work. Well, in fact, they do work. We've seen it in Europe. Uh, in Germany, uh, there's lots of retraining and it is very helpful. In the Netherlands, there's a lot of job retraining. We just never really focused on it. We didn't make it a priority and say, we're going to come up with a really good useful job retraining. You know, I gave you the example of what, of what happened in Canada. There was a job focused job retraining program. And vocational education is also important. You know, we also, we have in the past been dismissive of that, but you know, not everybody need, you know, is going to go to college there. It's just not necessarily in the cards, but someone like Clayton Green or, or uh, Farland Knapp, you know, if they had had vocational training, uh, that would have given them something to fall back on if they lost a job or, you know, some sort of skills, you know, trade skills that they could actually um, fall back on. That would have helped. And it also would have gotten them more used to actually more training or, or uh, you know, understanding that you have to train yourself to get uh, to, to upskill uh, and, and get a new job. And so I think it's important for the society to, to recognize that um, we need to allocate more funds for these kinds of programs. Nick, do you want to add anything before I go to a question that you asked me to suggest? Um, no, go ahead. I'm trying to think what that question was. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about how some of these types of prescriptions are progressive and in some ways, perhaps, as we discussed, more identified with the Democratic Party, but you do have many of the folks in Yamhill and otherwise who are uh, Trump voters. And I guess my question that we talked about is, how do you square that? And is there any room for a change perspective? Yeah, no, th I think that's, that's interesting. And people often ask me, you know, how is it that folks could, could vote against their interests in this way? And uh, one of the people we talked about in the book is my old seventh grade questionnaire mayor, who is, you know, really smart, really hardworking, really talented, but just um, struggled for many years with alcohol and with drugs spent seven years homeless. Um, and so she knows better than any of us, you know, the, the difficulties of, of uh, the ways in which America's falling short. And we asked her once, so Mary, you know, did you ever think there was a political solution to these kinds of problems? And she said, well, traditionally she didn't, but then in 2016, she did. And for the first time in her life, she voted for Donald Trump. And um, <laughs> I, so I guess, uh, I would say that places like Yam Hill have voted uh, disproportionately for Trump and the white working class has voted for Trump. But I would note that it's really because of social conservatism, not economic policy. So the working class, whether black or white, tends to be socially conservative, but economically liberal. If the issue is um, abortion, 
they're more likely to favor Republicans. If the issue is same-sex marriage, the same. But if the issue is raising the minimum wage or expanding access to health care or providing early childhood support, uh, Democratic and uh, you know, African American working class voters go to the polls and uh, vote for Democrats because issues of racial justice trump those of abortion. White working class uh, folks have tended to vote for Republicans because issues of guns or abortion have trumped those of the minimum wage. Frankly, this year, when we have 11.5 million people. Uh, who had jobs in February who don't have jobs now, when so many people are struggling to put food on the table, I think that people are a little bit more likely to think of those economic interests when they cast their ballots. Although I think it's also very important to understand that politics sometimes is divorced from the economy in the sense that there are people who don't always know uh, that the expanded Medicaid program that they are availing of uh, was the result of Obamacare. And they just know that, oh yeah, there's this program that I can take advantage of. And then also, um, as a result of COVID, uh, because of the lockdowns, a lot of people say, oh, that's the problem. Of the, the Democrats are the ones who shut down the economy. Uh, Trump has been trying to open the economy, but he can't because the Democrats want to shut down the economy. So I do think that there is sometimes justification for just being on the, on the team, on the right team. Uh, and they think of the red team versus the blue team. And often, I think what happens is that People think the leader, the top leader, the president is so divorced from anything that would affect them that they aren't quite sure, you know, if voting really makes a difference, you know, their vote. So they might as well vote for the person they like. Um, and, uh, you know, that if, if it's a personality contest, they like Trump because he's this, you know, crazy guy who's, you know, almost like them in the sense that, you know, he's against the establishment. And so are they because they're outside of the establishment. So I think there's a little bit of, of that going on as well as, you know, whether or not they identify with, you know, um, you know economic liberalism or not. Sure. Uh, two other quick questions before we take it to audience questions. One, you know, given the amount of racial injustice and other issues in this country, are there parallels to the race issues affecting the black community in Yamhill and beyond of a race class issue at play? So, um, I'd say that so the, the, a place like Yamhill is overwhelmingly white, and so there tends to be a lot of uh, hostility, not so much toward African Americans as toward uh, Latino immigrants. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the you know Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric went over very well among working class uh, folks here because they believe that immigration uh, has been taking away their jobs. And, you know, if you're struggling, uh, if you've lost jobs, you've seen your, your, your real pay decline, then you welcome a scapegoat. And uh, I think Trump appealed to them on that front. Um, I think that, you know, on the question of African-American and white working class voters, they have traditionally kind of worked at odds, uh, both in terms of who they vote for, at least since Reagan, and uh, in some ways in terms in the private sector that white labor unions often excluded uh, black workers. Um, Bobby Kennedy made a really heroic effort to bring the white and black working classes together to recognize their shared interests. And I would love to see the Democratic Party uh, obviously already has made common ground with African American workers um, I think that many American progressives have kind of lost faith in the white working class because they voted for Trump, because they are perceived as, um, you know, voting for conservatives ever since Reagan. I, do, I think it's a mistake to give up on them. And I think sometimes progressive rhetoric about how these folks are bigots and racists and lost causes, I think, simply increases the likelihood that they are going to vote for Republicans again not only in the presidential race, but in Senate races, House races, and local races. So uh, last question before we go to audience questions. Our museum, and one day you will come there and we'll show it to you, world-class institution. Teaches, we look forward to that, Rick. <laughs> indeed. 
teaches to be people to be upstanders, proactive, positive forces for change. And you've written that many people feel psyched out, that they feel that they, they don't take any, it, it's about personal responsibility or the problem of homelessness is simply too large or it doesn't affect us or the US, pick either one is wrong. So the question is, what can you do? And you know, very briefly, if you could give us a synopsis, you have an appendix to your book entitled 10 Steps That You Can Take in the Next 10 Minutes to Make a Difference. So share a little of that with us before I go to audience questions. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, people get psyched out, but there's so many reasons why they should not be. There has been enormous progress. Uh, and I think we often forget to talk about the progress because we want to say, oh, these problems are so large, we need, we need help. But there has been enormous progress. You know, more globally, there's been tremendous progress on poverty. So the number, the percentage of, of people or the numbers of people who have, are dying from malnutrition or what before the age of five, uh, because they don't get vaccinations or something like that has dramatically fallen 60% since 1990. So if you're just looking at the past 25 years, that's gonna be about 125 million uh, children's, uh, children's lives saved. So that's huge progress. In some ways, it's never been a better time to be a young kid in the developing world. Now, COVID is changing a lot of that. Um, I, I do fear that there is going to be a huge repercussion, not just from people in the developing world getting COVID, it's more from the aftermath of COVID spreading around the world, partly because a lot of programs to vaccinate children have been halted uh, during the pandemic. And so that means a lot of children will not get their vaccinations. Uh, they're also, because the economy is not doing as well, that means a lot of these families who used to sell vegetables on, on the roadside or who used to be late day laborers, they're just not gonna get jobs. And so their they can't feed their kids. They're gonna sell their daughters you know, to other families as, you know, in child marriages. So we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna see some significant problems, but uh, that is not to underestimate that we as a, a global force uh, can't, uh, you know, change the world again because we were making tremendous progress. Um, here at home even, uh, the rate of teenage pregnancy has declined dramatically. It's still too high, um, but, uh, it has declined dramatically, so that means a lot fewer kids born uh, into homes that don't want these babies. Uh, and that's important because as we talked about earlier, the early childhood education, it's so important. And if you don't want this kid, then the kid's not gonna actually be treated very well. Um, so I think that that's, uh, uh, I think it's really important to understand that there is progress so that you shouldn't get psyched out. So in, in terms of some of the things that we talked about, you know, 10 things that you can do in the next, uh, you know, 10 minutes. There's one is to get educated. Um, two is also to do something that we don't normally think of as, as helping out. And that's actually joining a group that might be focusing on advocacy. advocacy. Um, so, um, uh, you know, sometimes you think that you always have to donate money. Um, but advocacy is really powerful. Uh, and that means not just, you know, you've got your own social media spotlight, you can you know, get your friends to, to recognize some of these issues, highlight these issues on your social media uh, more than you normally do, uh, get a bunch of people together and start a book club. Um, you can read there, I hear there's a book called Tightrope that might be very interesting. Uh, and you can come up with areas that you'd all like to, you know, try and focus on and learn more about, and then maybe figure out a, a good way to, to try and do something about. If people want to do yeah. something right away, then let me just suggest a few things they can, practical things they can do. Um, Reading Partners is a great organization that allows one to read to a particular child, help that child advance in reading. iMentor is a organization that allows one to mentor a kid who needs it. Uh, and iMentor means that it's particularly practical for a time of COVID, one can do it uh, you know, uh, on screen. Um, and in terms of policy, then results.org, is a terrific grassroots organization that advocates for uh, smarter policies. And finally, fourth, and as important as anything, vote. Yes. Indeed. Uh, you know, you also mentioned sponsoring a child through Save the Children. And to your point, Cheryl, 
Tony Blair, for example, to your point about how results can make a difference, cut childhood poverty, I believe, in half while he was prime minister. Absolutely. Of exactly. So let me go to a few questions from the audience here. So we have a question here. Do you think that city dwellers have lost touch and empathy with the people in small towns and rural areas? If so, what might be able to be done to change this? You touched on this already a little in your comments. Cheryl, anything both of you would like to add? I, I mean, I'd love to see some kind of a national service uh, program that would mix people of different classes, of different geographies, of different political ideologies. And I, I, I don't think it works to make it mandatory. I just think that creates college paid for would be a terrific way to expand opportunity and also uh, mix the country up a little bit. You know, another question that's asked here, which touches on your go out to vote, how can we convince people on the tightrope to get out to vote for vital issues that seem to reject, uh, which they reject often to their detriment? So any encouragement or thoughts on that? So, I think in part, it's a function, I mentioned Bobby Kennedy earlier, he listened, so he went on listening tours, and there's a perception among a lot of working class voters that Washington politicians, and especially Democrats from cities, are coming and kind of lecturing them or hectoring them and not doing enough listening. And there's often also a barrier of faith that makes, creates suspicions. I think that uh, that really kind of doing a certain amount of listening would go over very well. Um, and emphasizing these economic issues that look, you may not agree with me on gun policy. You may not agree with me on Roe v. Wade, but that you, I'm sure you do agree with me on raising the minimum wage, which, uh, you know, if, if the 1968 federal minimum wage had kept up with inflation and productivity, would now be $22 an hour. Um, and so I think there are ways that, you know, they're not going to win over every working class white voter. They can sure make a difference. And, and I, would, I would just add, you know, you've already got your Supreme Court justices. There's nothing more on that front to, <laughs> to aim for. So you might also now aim for a better economy and a higher minimum wage, expanded health care, because otherwise you might lose those things. Absolutely. Let's touch on a term you use in your book a little, which also comes up in some of the questions, escape artists, people who rose above the dire circumstances that found them. On the issue that's been raised about do, can we have hope, Speak a little about, too, Nick, you wrote about, I think in a host of columns, about Tani, the chess champion, homeless child, and his amazing story and trajectory, and a girl named Anne from Oregon, who I think will shock some of our audience in terms of who this is. Could you talk a little, one or both of you, about those two people, because they're frankly uplifting stories. Why don't you tell about Tani? Okay, let me, I'll tell you about Tani and uh, Cheryl will tell you about Anne. So uh, Tani is a Nigerian refugee kid in uh, the second grade in New York City. He, uh, there is a chess program. Uh, it's unusual to have a chess program in elementary school like that, but it does. And he couldn't afford to join the chess club because he was homeless. Uh, but his mom asked for and the school agreed to waive the fees to join. He became, he, he promptly became a really brilliant chess player and then won the New York State Chess Championship while living in his homeless shelter. And I walked with him uh, from the school to his homeless shelter carrying this huge chess trophy, you know, as, uh, as tall as he was. And um, uh, what struck me was that, you know, this is a family that was poor in resources but so rich in emotional support, in love, in determination that Tani would get every, every, every opportunity and every advantage. And that school came through. I mean, they waived that chess club fee. They uh, allowed him to go to tournaments without paying. They made sure he wasn't embarrassed because he couldn't buy sandwiches. Um, and the result is that Tani's 
potential is able to uh, be reached in ways that benefit us all. So the story about Anne is really important because it's a story about how we, ordinary people, can actually uh, change people's lives as well and how targeted help uh, can, and you know, I've talked about this, but targeted help can really uh, be more powerful than you can ever imagine. So while Nick was growing up in, uh, in uh, Yamhill, Oregon, uh, there was a young girl named Anne who was growing up in Southern Oregon, in Ashland. And so Anne was from a working class family. She was the oldest of five kids. Her parents did not go to college, working class all the way. And her father had been in the military, uh, you know, had very conventional ways of looking at the world. And, you know, his kids didn't need to go to college. So she was in her senior year of high school and she was walking down the, 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 the hallway and she saw a teacher. And the teacher said, okay, um, Anne, uh, you know, where are you going to college? It was the spring of senior year and everybody's asking that question. And she goes, oh, oh, I'm not going to college, you know, because, um, you know, my father didn't go to college. We can't afford it. It's just much too expensive. And we're working class. And, and the teacher looks at Anne and says, Anne, you come with me and dragged her to the school office and said, you've missed most of the deadlines, but there are still a couple of universities that are open. I want you to go home, fill out this application, ordered her to fill out an application. Well, so Anne went home. She filled out one application because the fees, the application fees were expensive. So she filled out University of Oregon. Well, of course she got in. And in fact, she got a scholarship uh, from an organization. She went to college. She had odd jobs to help support her, her college fees. And, you know, she even was a maid one time in a hotel. And, uh, you know, she studied journalism. And then after she graduated from college, she got a job at a local TV station, uh, which was terrific. She was obviously very talented and she did really well at that TV station. She kept going up and up and up. And obviously we all know recently that Ann Curry was anchor for the Today Show. And it really goes to show that there are so many diamonds in the working class that we don't know about. And you never know when you're going to lift up the next Ann Curry. So open your eyes and, <laughs> and see who you can help. Excellent. Um, and Nick, to your point with Tanny, um, if I, my memory serves me, people did reach out. They got a home. Bill Clinton met with them. I think there was a GoFundMe page that ra raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there are good stories out there. There's no question. Let me ask one question about the press, because you say in your book, and uh, I have a daughter who's a journalist. Um, is there more that the press should do on a daily basis? They're covering God knows there's a lot of breaking news, but they're not telling the everyday stories. And would that, you know, add heat and light to some of the attention and issues here? Yeah, I know. I think we can do a, you know, a, a better job. And it always strikes me that the issues that we as a society do the worst job in addressing policy toward are those that are hard to talk about. It's domestic violence, it's drugs, anything to do with sex, it's mental health. And I think that it becomes incumbent upon us as journalists to try to break these taboos, to get people talking, to make people think about these, to project them onto the agenda. And, you know, the fact that every two weeks we lose more Americans from drugs, alcohol, and suicide than we did in the entire Iraq and Afghan wars with so little attention, so little thought. I think that that's a shortcoming of us as journalists. And we tend to focus on something that we think of the news as what happens on a particular day. Sometimes the most important stories don't happen on a particular day, they happen every day. And I think we can do a better job highlighting those. Absolutely, well, that's a good place, I think, to, to stop, I'm going to turn it back. First, thank you so much, Cheryl and uh, Nick. It was a pleasure. And I'm going to turn it back to Wendy. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank Rick. Thank you, Rick. And thanks, Wendy. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight for this meaningful and inspiring program. We do have a few more signed copies by Nick and Cheryl of Tightrope Americans for Reaching Hope in our gift shop, which is open in person 
or online on our website if you're interested. Please take a moment to fill out the survey that was placed in the chat. Your feedback is so important to us. And finally, our museum is open to the public Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 a.m. through 5 p.m. And our listing of upcoming public programs can be found at www.illinoisholocaustmuseum.org. Thank you guys so much. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great evening.